Hi everyone and welcome to Biology Professor. Today we're going to be talking about antibiotic resistant bacteria. This is a growing problem for healthcare around the world and that's why I think it's important to talk about today. Let's start by looking at some common examples of antibiotic resistant bacteria. We've got Staphylococcus aureus, Clostridium difficile, and Klebsiella pneumoniae. And of course there are others, but these are three common ones that you might hear of. Now before we start talking about how they cause disease, I want to emphasize that actually all three of these bacteria are sometimes found in part of the human normal microbial flora. For example, Staphylococcus aureus is commonly found in the nose, throats, and on the skin of many people around the world without causing infection. Clostridium difficile is often found in low numbers in the human colon. And Klebsiella pneumoniae is also found in humans sometimes in the mouth, on the skin, and in the intestines without really causing disease. However, when they do cause disease, they can have some pretty scary symptoms. For example, Staphylococcus aureus can cause sepsis which is a very serious bacterial infection of the blood. It can also cause necrotizing infections. <laughs> necrotizing means flesh eating. So you can imagine how scary an infection like that would be. Now, Normally, when you get an infection with the bacteria, you can go to the doctor, you can go to the hospital, you can get an antibiotic to treat that infection. However, there are strains of Staph aureus that are resistant to many types of bacteria. For example, you might have heard of something called MRSA. That is M-R-S-A. It stands for methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So this is Staph aureus that is resistant to a lot of different drugs, but most notably methicillin, which just a few years ago was one of the most important antibiotics that we had. MRSA, in the past few years, the only antibiotic we really had to treat it has been one called vancomycin. But now, as you might guess, we have bacteria called MRSA. or, any guesses what that stands for? Vancomycin-resistant Staph aureus. So this is Staph aureus that is resistant not only to methicillin and all of the other things that MRSA is resistant to, but also to vancomycin. So that's becoming a major problem in the healthcare industry. Clostridium difficile is most known for causing diarrhea. And of course, severe diarrhea can lead to severe dehydration. C. diff is uh, something you'll also hear it called by the abbreviation C. diff. It also can cause inflammation of the colon called pseudomembranous colitis. So maybe you can imagine if you get a, an infection by a Clostridium difficile that is resistant to antibiotics, you have diarrhea that can't be cured, you're getting very dehydrated, you're having really bad abdominal pain from something like pseudomembranous colitis, and it's just a very painful thing to have. Now Clebsiella pneumoniae, it is perhaps best known for causing pneumonia, as you might be able to guess from its name. It can also infect other things though. For example, it can infect wounds, like if you cut yourself or you get burned, it can establish an infection that way. And it can also result in bacteremia. This means that if it gets into the bloodstream, it can cause an infection there. Now, recently, you may have heard of something called KPC. K 
KPC stands for Klebsiella pneumoniae carbapenemase. Carbapenems are a type of drug that is normally used to treat an infection with, of Klebsiella. KPC is a type of Klebsiella pneumoniae which produces an enzyme called carbapenemase which actually degrades the carbapenem drugs that would normally be used to treat it. Thus, it's resistant and that reduces the number of antibiotics that we have to fight an infection like KPC. I want to emphasize that all three of these types of bacteria, if they're able to establish these infections that we've talked about, and if they can't be treated appropriately, every single one of them can result in death. Now, all three of these, as well as other types of antibiotic-resistant bacteria, are often called nosocomial infections. What does nosocomial mean? Well, it's actually just a fancy word for hospital acquired. Basically, if you get a nosocomial infection, it means that you went to the hospital for some reason. There are many reasons that we go to the hospital, right? Maybe we are having a surgery. Maybe we have gotten a, a wound that needs treated. Maybe we're there to be treated for cancer or to have a baby or, or many other reasons. What happens is that sometimes you go to the hospital and while you're there being treated for one thing, you acquire an infection from hospital staff or from other patients. These are called nosocomial infections and all three of these can be transmitted in this way. Of course, it's also possible to get them outside of a hospital. Um, in particular, MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus, is known to be transmitted just in the general community. Now, you might be asking yourself, how do these organisms develop resistance? <clears throat> well, there are four main ways that we're going to talk about today for how these bacteria are able to be resistant to different types of drugs. The first one is that some bacteria are able to produce enzymes, like KPC with the carbapenemase, that are able to degrade a given drug. Another good example of this is bacteria that can make penicillinases. Penicillin was the very first antibiotic discovered. It was the first one harnessed for human healthcare to treat a large number of infections, and it was a very, very important drug in its time. Unfortunately, there are now a lot of bacteria that make penicillinases. These are enzymes that cleave the part of penicillin called the beta-lactam ring that's basically part of the chemical structure of penicillin. They cleave that ring and then penicillin can no longer work. Normally it inhibits the synthesis of molecules that are important for certain types of bacteria in building their cell wall, but if those bacteria have penicillinases, the penicillin doesn't hurt them. Another way that these organisms can use to develop resistance is by keeping the drug from reaching its target. example, there is an antibiotic called tetracycline. It works by binding to the bacterial ribosome and keeping the ribosome from synthesizing proteins that the bacteria needs to survive. 
there are some bacteria that are resistant to tetracycline because they're able to modify it in such a way that it does not it, it does not ever reach the ribosome. So if it can't reach the ribosome, if it can't get through the cytoplasm of the cell to the ribosome, then it can't exert its effects. Thus, those bacteria are resistant to tetracycline. A third way that these bacteria can develop antibiotic resistance is by modifying the drug target. So I just told you that the ribosome is a common target of drugs. This is because bacterial ribosomes and human ribosomes have some fundamental structural differences so that if you are giving a human a drug that binds to a bacterial ribosome, there won't be any toxicity effects for the human host because their own ribosomes are different. This means that the ribosome is a very important target for several different classes of antibiotics. But some bacteria can take their ribosome, which would be the target of a given drug, And some bacteria can modify the ribosome. Basically, through random mutation, they can end up having ribosomes that have been changed structurally just enough that they can still produce the proteins necessary for these bacteria to survive, but the drugs can no longer bind to the ribosomes as they would have been able to do originally. Thus, bacteria that are able to modify ribosomes or other drug targets in this way are suddenly able to be resistant to these drugs. The fourth way that we're going to talk about is by having drug ejection pumps. That sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? Basically, the drug ejection pumps are these pumps that are in the cell membrane and the cell wall of the bacteria so that when a drug diffuses into the cell, these drug ejection pumps just pump it right back out again. And so there's never enough drug in the bacterial cell to kill it. So it's a fairly cool mechanism, but really not good for us when we're infected with the type of bacteria that can just get rid of the drugs that we throw at it. Now, drug ejection pumps, they can actually move from one bacterial cell to another by way of plasmids in a process called conjugation. Basically, the genes for these drug ejection pumps are often carried on plasmids. And plasmids can be copied in one cell and then given to another cell through this process called conjugation. If you're interested in learning more about conjugation, you can see my other video that's on that topic in more detail. But basically, the drug ejection pumps are just able to pump those drugs out and, be resi and then the bacteria are resistant to those drugs. Now, you might be asking, this lecture was a lot of gloom and doom, right? Look at all these antibiotic resistant bacteria, all of the mechanisms through which they can become antibiotic resistant. You might be asking, what can we do? What can we do to keep more bacteria from becoming antibiotic resistant? To keep MRSA and VRSA and KPC from becoming resistant to even more kinds of antibiotics? Well, there are a few ways to do that. First, it's important to use antibiotics only when you really need them. So if you're, if you're really sick, yes, go to the doctor, go to the hospital, get some antibiotics to cure your infection. But if you're just feeling a little under the weather, you don't need to be taking antibiotics, especially if they might not even be specific to treat the type of infection that you may have. It's also important to take the right dose. This means that if your doctor tells you, take two tablespoons of this every day, you need to take two tablespoons, not just one. 
if you take a dose of the antibiotic that is not enough to kill the bacteria to actually um, to actually cure the infection, then you get these bacteria in your body that they've been exposed to low levels of these drugs that were not enough to kill them, but were enough to allow them to acquire resistance through some of these mechanisms. It's also important to finish the antibiotic regimen that your doctor prescribes. Now, we've all been sick before, right? We've all had infections and felt bad and gone to our doctor and gotten an antibiotic. And maybe our doctor tells us, take two of these capsules every day, um, twice a day, for 10 days. And so we start doing that. But by day five, hey, I'm feeling better, right? I've been taking this medicine, and I'm feeling better now. Well, you've still got five days of that antibiotic regimen left. If your doctor told you, take this for 10 days, take it for 10 days. Otherwise, you can have happen what we just discussed. That being that you've got bacteria in your body that have been exposed to these drugs but haven't been killed by them yet because you haven't finished the full 10 days. Because they've been exposed to these drugs, they've had time to sort of build up some resistance and you can then spread them to other people because you didn't finish your antibiotic regimen that your doctor prescribed. Finally, the fourth way that we're going to talk about today to prevent antibiotic resistance is to use more than one drug at a time. Sometimes when you're in the hospital and you've got a serious infection, your doctor might actually administer two or even three drugs at a time. The reason for this is because it's very unlikely that a, a bacterial cell can develop resistance to two or three different drugs that work through different mechanisms at the same time. So by using more than one drug at a time, you can help to prevent this antibiotic resistance. Of course, you should always consult with the doctor first to figure out the best treatment regimen for whatever a given infection may be. So that's all we've got today for antibiotic resistance. I hope you learned a lot and found it interesting, and thank you for watching our biology professor videos. Thanks.